Hello friends, welcome back to a walk through the theology of the body. This is Bill Donahue here at TOB Institute headquarters in southeastern Pennsylvania. We are going to pray and dive into audience 85 of St. John Paul II's Theology of the Body today. We are going to be concluding part one of his epic teaching on the human person. And um, there was another big truck traffic here. We're going to complete this part one with audience 85, which will close our meditation on celibacy and virginity for the kingdom. And you'll see next week we begin, uh, well, we close officially next week and begin the, um, the second phase of this call to vocation and living out marriage and then celibacy for the kingdom. So we've come a long way, friends. Here we go. Let's dive in with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious Lord, thank you for this time and this technology that allows us to connect and to reflect on this great teaching of John Paul the Great. May he intercede for us that we might understand the beauty of your plan for us, revealed in sacred scripture and echoed in our own hearts and our own experience. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. St. John Paul II, pray for us in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so here we go. We're diving into audience 85, delivered July 14th of 1982. Again, St. John Paul II is uh, still pondering the words of Jesus about the human person called to celibacy for or con continence for the kingdom. So how our identity as men and women is here and now, but does not end here and now, but points to um, our ultimate union with him in heaven. Okay, so section one of audience 85. During our earlier considerations, when we analyzed 1 Corinthians 7, we tried to gather together and understand the teachings and counsels St. Paul gave us in the addresses uh, of his letter on the questions regarding marriage and abstaining from marriage. Affirming that the one who chooses marriage does well and that the one who chooses virginity does better. The apostle refers to the transitoriness of the world or of everything temporal. Okay, so St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, reflecting on the passing world, we reflected on the fact that the expectation for the second coming was high, right? The parousia, Jesus' return. And so Paul was uh, also, you know, just his own journeys, his own missionary work and the threat on his life. Uh, life was passing, life was transitory, life was temporal. So he had this idea uh, in his mind and heart as he reflected on the human person and our call to union with Christ. John Paul goes on. It's easy to grasp that the motive of the transitoriness and instability of what's temporal here and now, this world, speaks, in this case, with much greater force than the reference to the reality of the other world. Okay, so obviously right now is uh, day to day, day to day, and it can be very um, unstable in a sense. It can be very unpredictable, be very unpredictable. Although the Apostle's way of expressing himself here is not without difficulty, we can still agree that what lies at the basis of the Pauline interpretation of the subject of marriage and virginity is not so much the metaphysics of accidental being, but rather the theology of a great expectation. Okay, a, the theology of a great expectation. This experience of human love and marriage, this experience of the Lord through consecrated virginity or celibacy, he says, is this theology of a great expectation. Whose fervent spokesman Paul was, not the world is man's eternal destiny, but the kingdom of God. Okay, this is the sort of lightning rod that kind of like just draws um, all hearts and awakens in us this answer to the question of our hearts that long for something forever, something not transitory, something that has the imprint of, of eternity upon it. So Paul is alluding to this. And this becomes the lodestar of his theology of the body, St. Paul. Man cannot attach himself too much to the goods that follow the measure of a transitory world. Right? Again, this makes sense. We probably experience this in our own lives. When we root or anchor, try to anchor or chain ourselves to something in this world, it very quickly fades. It very quickly withers like that forbidden fruit in the hand, right? Uh, like the flower that's cut and then put in a vase lasts a few days, right? It's transitory. It passes. So man cannot attach himself too much to the goods that follow the measure of a transitory world. Um, we, we sometimes we keep trying, but we often um, 
come to emptiness, right? We realize like this isn't going to do it. This isn't going to fulfill. So Paul is pointing us to uh, the ultimate end, the eternal good. So section two, marriage also is tied to the stage of this world, which is passing. Okay, uh, <laughs> I'll pause right there because that's provocative. Thinking of like my own marriage, my own experience with Rebecca in our last almost 16 years now of marriage, uh, and the stage of this world, it's passing. Our vows reflect that. You know, we pledge to love each other till death do us part. So even in that beginning, that beautiful day that brought us together and brings husbands and wives together, their marriage, there's already the mark of passing, transitoriness. That shouldn't give us a sense of like, oh man, how sad, well, why even do it? You know, <laughs> not at all. We realize that it's anchored in eternity, that this love that we share now will fully be realized and blossom in the eternal marriage with God. So it gives power and poignancy and purpose to marriage right now. So we should reflect on the beauty of marriage. Okay, so he says marriage also is tied to the stage of this world, which is passing. And here we are in some way quite close to the perspective Christ opened in his statement about the future resurrection. According to Paul's teaching, the Christian must live marriage from the point of view of his definitive vocation. Nice. The Christian must live marriage from the point of view of his definitive vocation. Here we are in a world transitory, and yet many people outside of this light of revelation are thinking, well, this is the end. This is it. This is all we've got. Therefore, I need my ultimate fulfillment in this, in this person, this experience, this maybe marriage. Is it no wonder that we have a 51, 52% divorce rate, even among Catholics? We're rooting ourselves in the transitoriness of the world. But no, the Pope is saying, live marriage from the point of view of of his of its definitive vocation man that would just liberate so many men and women to realize like wow this person that i'm married to with their flaws that i experience daily and with their awesomeness and beauty is is also passing and i shouldn't anchor my eternal happiness in that person that should free us to really enjoy the gift of each other and the whole roller coaster ride of, of married life Right, so buckle up. It is a roller coaster ride, if you haven't already noticed. While marriage is tied to the stage of this world, which is passing, and thus imposes in some way the necessity of closing oneself in this transitoriness, okay, because we're here, time and space right now, this is it, as we move closer to heaven. Abstaining from marriage, one could say by contrast, okay, so celibacy, virginity, liberates from such necessity. Exactly for this reason, the Apostle Paul declares, the one who chooses continence does better. Okay, that should be abundantly clear by now. We've gone over this in the last few uh, audiences. It makes sense. It's not saying marriage is worthless or no good. It's just saying that there's a the, the clarity with which celibacy and virginity points to the eternal marriage um, has a an objective betterness to it. It doesn't mean that, therefore, marriage is worthless. John Paul's been so clear on that, and it's going to be really clear on it as we close off this audience today. Although his argument follows this path, nevertheless, Paul decidedly gives first place to the question of pleasing the Lord and being anxious about what is the Lord's. We talked about how that's a, a loving relationship for both vocations, to please the other. Section 3. One can suppose the same reasons speak in favor of the counsel the apostle gives to women who are widowed. Uh, he goes on, the wife is bound, this is Paul's words, the wife is bound for the whole time in which the husband's alive, but if the husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, only in the Lord. Okay? But in my judgment, Paul says, it's better if she remains as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. Okay, so he's, St. Paul is using um, his own judgment here, he's making a, a call, and he's saying, but I also think this is in the Spirit of God. Thus, she should remain a widow rather than enter a new marriage. Okay, Paul is clearly saying, like, th these are my thoughts. I think they're in the spirit of the Lord. Okay. Through what, section 4, through what we discover in a clear-sighted reading of 1 Corinthians, we discover the whole realism of the Pauline theology of the body. Okay, now, this is really important stuff here. And there's a lot I highlighted, of course, pretty much everything. 
Still, such awareness about our ultimate end in no way eclipses for him the reality of the gift of God in which both those who abstain from marriage and those who take husband or wife come to share. We find a clear encouragement in 1 Corinthians 7 to abstain from marriage and the conviction that one who decides to abstain does better. But nevertheless, here it comes, we don't find any foundation for considering those who live in marriage carnal and those, by contrast, for religious reasons, choose continence spiritual. Okay, what would that be if we thought this was just fleshy, um, bound to the flesh only, uh, and somehow less than? That would be Manichaean. That would be a, this idea that um, I'm better than you just because I choose something spiritual and you didn't. The Pope's saying that's not true. In fact, in one as well as the other way of living, marriage and celibacy, Today we would say, in one as well as the other vocation, the gift is at work. That each one receives from God, that is, grace. Which brings it about that the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And remains such in virginity as well as in marriage. It's beautiful. The gift is at work in both vocations. Receive from God, it's grace which brings about the body as a temple of the spirit. It's in virginity, it's in marriage. If man re remains faithful to his own gift, and in conformity with his state or vocation, does not dishonor the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is his body. Okay, so both vocations can dishonor the temple of the Holy Spirit, but being open to the gift, each vocation can also construct, with the help of God, this temple, can keep it pure, holy. Not construct. God constructs it. We uh, can help decorate it. Section 5. So he says what I was just saying. We don't find any premise for what was later to be called Manichaeism. Right? Body bad, spirit good. The apostle is fully aware that even though continence for the kingdom is always worthy of recommendation, at the same time, that is, one's own gift of God, the gift of your vocation, whatever it is, um, helps also spouses in the shared life in which they are so closely united they become one flesh. Do you see how John Paul is balancing out now this idea of the vocations as both leading to holiness? This was really in a lot of ways revolutionary, this development of doctrine St. John Paul II's bringing to the church because it had really, you know, even until the 1950s, 60s, this idea that priests and religious are up here just by nature of what they've chosen and married people are down here, but both can share in holiness. There, um, this shared carnal life now uses carnal in the more um, experience of the sacramentality of marriage. This shared carnal life is subject to the power of their own gift from God. Okay, then here's a quote from First Corinthians seven again: "The husband should carry out his duty toward his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband." And I love this line. This is very powerful. For the wife is not arbiter over her own body. Okay, ultimate end, absolute master of. But the husband is. The wife is not arbiter over her own body, but the husband is. Now before you start thinking like that sounds like um, some form of slavery. Likewise, the husband is not arbiter over his own body, but the wife is. Right? We have each mutually given our bodies, ourselves, to the other in the in the sign of marriage. And so um, the body becomes this mutual exchange, this gift. We're not our own anymore, right? We're, we're, we have handed ourselves over. Tradere is the Latin tradition, right? This is our tradition, that we're handing ourselves over to one another. You're no longer your own. Beautiful. Okay, I'm going to jump to section seven. For now, we will continue to turn our attention to the other sentences in the same passage, 1 Corinthians 7, in which the Apostle addresses the following words to spouses. Do not abstain from each other, except by common agreement for a set time, to devote yourselves to prayer, and then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you through lack of self-control. This I say by way of concession, not of command. This, St. John Paul II says, is a very significant passage to which we will have to return in the context of our meditations on the other topics. Okay, we have lots to go. Highly significant is the fact that the Apostle Paul, who, like Christ, makes a clear distinction between commandment and evangelical counsel, K 
Okay. One is uh, directly given by God. The other is like interpreted like, okay, let's figure this out. You know, Moses made many concessions in the Old Testament, which Jesus then had to like ramp up a little bit, clarify. Uh, so he makes a distinction between commandment and evangelical counsel in his argumentation about marriage and continence. He senses the need to refer also to concession as a supplementary rule. Above all, in particular, to reference to the spouses and their relations. Paul clearly says both conjugal relations and the voluntary periodic abstinence of the spouses must be a fruit of the gift of God, which is their own. Okay, natural family planning, couples that practice NFP must be very attentive to this gift of God that allows them to practice that self-mastery, self-control, okay, so that they can, um, again, be master of their own innermost impulses, as John Paul writes later, um, so that they can more fully become the gift for the other person. It's not a place for slavery even to our own passions, right? Marriage is a place for freedom, not a place for slavery to our own passions or, you know, the release thereof. Always this sense of reverence for your body and the body of your beloved. Okay. Do, 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 section 8. It seems that pa the Pauline rule of concession indicates the need to consider all that in some way corresponds to the subjectivity highly differentiated of man and woman. Okay, very attentive to the personhood of this person and their interior life. Everything in this subjectivity, not only what's spiritual, but what's psychosomatic, body, soul, the whole makeup of a person. Man's whole subjective wealth, which expresses itself between his spiritual and material being, and the sensibility specific to the man as well as to the woman, all this must remain under the influence of the gift of each of them, received from God, a gift that's his or her very own. In that little line there, John Paul is so attentive to the mystery of each unique person. He has such deep reverence and love. We call him the apostle of the human person, St. John Paul II, because he just saw this temple of God that every person is. And he's talking here about like this sense of the wonder of that, especially in marriage. He's talking about marriage in that paragraph there. Okay, now he's going to expand section 9. We're going to close off here in a second. He's talking about um, the different vocations. And this was the subject for this Facebook Live today, that each complement, they don't conflict. Okay, there has been distortions in the understanding of church's theology, right? That, that think that, again, one's better and one's worse. Um, one's holy and one's not so holy. Section 9. These two dimensions of the human vocation, okay, marriage and celibacy, as he rounds off these weeks and weeks of meditations, these two dimensions of the human vocation are not opposed to each other, but complementary. Both marriage and celibacy virginity provide a full answer to one of man's underlying questions of existence, right? The question about the meaning of being a body. That is, the meaning of masculinity and femininity, of being in the body, a man or a woman. Okay, how do we know what the meaning of being a body is except but in relation to another body and to every body? It's only in the light of the relationship to the other, be it any human person really, but especially, say, spouse or the mystery of Christ himself for the celibate and the consecrated. It's only in the light of the other body that my body makes sense. If we're constantly navel-gazing, if we're looking in our own junk all the time, or staring at our smartphones, we're not in relation. So how are we going to figure ourselves out? This, this creates all these disembodied ideologies and philosophies um, of, like, you know, self-care, self-empowerment. It's all about, and it's, it's not discovering who we really are by the other body, by looking at the other person. It's so important. Self-care is important, too. I think you got that, you know, in order, in order to love the other self. I'm not knocking that. Section 10. What we have customarily defined as theology of the body proves to be something truly fundamental and constitutive for anthropological hermeneutics as a whole. What? Anthropological hermeneutics is simply this comprehension or understanding of being a person. Anthropological hermeneutics. So the TOB is foundational, as we are saying. At the same time, equally fundamental for ethics, for the theology of human ethos, the inner disposition of our hearts. 
We must listen attentively, not only to the words of Christ. Now, here's, he's going to wrap up here this section, because this is the um, almost the conclusion of part one. We have to listen attentively, not only to the words of Christ, in which he appeals to the beginning, or to the human heart, as the interior and simultaneously historical place of the clash with the concupiscence of the flesh, but we must also listen attentively to the words in which Christ appealed to the resurrection. Okay, so the word of God about the beginning, the experience of the human heart about this battlefield right now, and also the words of Christ about the resurrection, um, which Christ appealed to the resurrection to implant in the same restless human heart the first seeds of the answer to the question about the meaning of being flesh and the perspective of the other world. <laughs> so good. Okay, so looking at our beginning in the light of God, looking at our present history with the light of God, longing for this destiny in the light of God, because it's Jesus who has come into this mess, this beautiful mess, and planted the first seeds of the answer to the question of being human. Crazy good stuff. Now, next week we'll pick up um, Audience 86, which will be the conclusion of Part 1. Um, beautiful stuff. And there is so much more to come, my friends. Okay, thank you for tuning in again for these uh, sometimes uh, laborious intellectual dives into John Paul's thought. I hope you're enjoying it. And please, thoughts, comments, insights, you can always throw in the comment section. Please pray for us um, at the Institute. Again, it's not too late to register. I'll be teaching a five-day retreat on the theology of the body, surrounded by prayer, fellowship for people all over the world, all over the country, March 17th to the 22nd, so just a couple weeks away. You can register at tobinstitute.org. We'd love to have you. We're really excited about it, and um, that's about that. So we'll see you next Wednesday. God bless.